Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, all you nations, extol him, extol him, all you peoples, for great is his love toward us, and the faithfulness of the Lord endures Greetings and felicitations. I'd like to thank you and welcome you to this video. This video is dedicated to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And uh, the video is about Dr. Erbart Ehrman. It is actually a response to a challenge issued by Dr. James White saying that people who hold to the TR uh, do not have a meaningful apologetic when it comes to men like Dr. Bart Ehrman. Um, and then he says, well, who's doing any work in, the, in this, in this, in the uh, field of the TR? And unfortunately, modern textual critics have dominated and own all of the, the universities, the colleges, and the seminaries when it comes to textual criticism. And so anyone who tries to get a PhD level, um, uh, a PhD level uh, degree in uh, textual criticism and holds to the TR, or King James Onlyist is how they generally call it, um, will not get into the university or college or seminary or anything like that. It's sort of the same kind of situation that a creationist would have with the uh, evolutionists when it comes to secular universities. Um, evolutionists just will not allow creationists to get a scientific degree when it comes to um, Creationism. They can't do like uh, specific work on creationism in their PhD thesis. Um, it has to be on something else, and uh, you know, some some for them to get a PhD on it. So um, it's that's kind of the same situation that um, that TRs or uh, Texas Receptus uh, people have when it, when they try to apply for a PhD in um, textual criticism. And the thing is, Dr. Bart Ehrman uh, probably will not uh, discuss uh, or, you know, even debate a person who has less than a PhD in, in the field. So um, maybe Dr. White will, I don't know. But um, that's the problem. Um, uh, the reason why you're not going to find people who are TRs who have PhD level things is not because they're not capable it's just that they're not allowed. Um, they're put off for one reason or another. So we have to revert to these videos in order to uh, do it. And in this video, what I'm trying, to, what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to present as objectively as possible uh, Dr. Bart Ehrman's positions, and then show how the holding to the TR position uh, you can uh, you can refute him. Um, part of this. Uh, well, this, this video has three parts. Um, the first part is going to be about Dr. Ehrman himself, who he is, what he does, etc. And uh, the second part is going to be Dr. Ehrman's um, adherence to what is called higher criticism. And we'll talk about higher criticism when we get to it. And the third part is going to be about Dr. Ehrman's views concerning lower criticism, or what this video has been uh, explaining, modern textual criticism. The manuscripts, the evidence of the manuscripts, etc. And uh, so without much further ado, let us get into the first part, which is, who is Dr. Ehrman? And we'll take a look at a video that he has produced that, and where he talks about himself. And then we'll talk about what he talks about. So uh, I hope you enjoy it, and here we go. It's very interesting being an agnostic scholar of religion. Uh, in this talk, I'd like to explore what it means for me to be one. I think I'll begin by explaining what I mean by, uh, what I myself mean by this term that I'm using, that we all use all the time, the term agnostic. 
because over the last 18 months or so, I've come to think it means something different from what I used to think. So what I used to think before I was an agnostic was that agnostics and atheists were two degrees of the same thing. Uh, and when I first declared myself agnostic, I was amazed at how militant both agnostics and atheists can be about their terms. <laughs> Every agnostic I met thought that atheists were simply arrogant agnostics. <laughs> and every atheist thought that every agnostic was simply a wimpy atheist. <laughs> Two degrees of the same thing. Well, someone will just say, I don't know. The other will admit they do know. And so that was the, I have come to think that in fact, they are not two degrees of the same thing, they're two different kinds of thing. That agnosticism has to do with epistemology. What you know, what you know. And atheism has to do with belief, what you believe. I actually consider myself to be both an agnostic and an atheist. I'm an agnostic because if somebody says to me, is there a greater power in the universe? My response is, how the hell would I know? <laughs> I don't know, so I'm an agnostic. If somebody were to ask me, do you believe in the God of the Bible? Do you believe in a God who interacts with the world, who intervenes in the world, who answers prayer? Do you believe in a supernatural divine being? No, I don't believe it. So I don't believe it, so I'm an atheist. But I don't know, so I'm an agnostic. Um, and since I'm a scholar, I prefer to emphasize knowledge rather than belief. And so I tend to identify as an agnostic. It's really unusual for anyone in my line of work to be an agnostic. Uh, I'm a professor of biblical studies. So there's a society of professors of biblical studies called the Society of Biblical Literature. We have our annual meeting every uh, November. Uh, there are probably 6,000 professors of religion in the Society of Biblical Literature. I don't have the exact number. I, I bet there are 6,000 of us who teach biblical studies at one level or another throughout the country. Uh, in seminaries, divinity schools, universities, colleges, and so forth and so on. Probably 6,000 of us. And they're, uh, well, <laughs> those of us who are agnostic or atheist are very much in the minority. Uh, Virtually everybody who teaches New Testament is, uh, is a Christian, as I was when I, started, uh, when I started being interested in biblical studies. Dan mentioned that I went to Wheaton College, the uh, alma mater of Billy Graham. Uh, I don't know if he knows this, but, uh, but in fact, for me, that was a step towards liberalism. <laughs> I started out at Moody Bible Institute whereas we used to say Bible is our middle name. <laughs> um, so uh, I, w I was a hardcore fundamentalist. I wasn't like those wimpy fundamentalists at, at Wheaton College. Um, but in any event, uh, we, those of us uh, who are atheists or agnostics in the Society of Biblical Literature are very much uh, in, in the minority. Well, there you go. There, that is Dr. Bart Ehrman. Dr. Bart Ehrman is a distinguished professor of religion at uh, North Carolina University in Chapel Hill. And uh, he's been teaching there for quite a while. And uh, as you can see, uh, he, in his own words, was once a fundamentalist. He attended Moody Bible College, where Bible is our middle name, he likes to joke. And then uh, he claims that when he uh, moved, uh, when he went to Wheaton College, that's when he started falling away from the faith. Um, he started becoming a uh, liberal, in his words. And uh, now he claims to be both an agnostic and an atheist. And it's interesting the way he, um, he presents it. Uh, he calls himself an agnostic because he doesn't know uh, if there is a divine being. And he calls himself an atheist because he doesn't believe that the God of the Bible is the divine being. Now, he's like the only professor that I have ever met. Well, I never met him personally, but I've ever interacted or talk, uh, 
you know, seeing him talk, um, who teaches people what he doesn't know. Uh, so it's kind of odd. Um, he's kind of an odd uh, creature as he is a professor of religion and yet he doesn't know if God exists and he certainly doesn't believe that the God of the Bible is uh, that God, if there is a God, I guess, if he, if he, if that's, if he was pressed on that matter. So um, Dr. White, in his um, debate with Dr. Bart Ehrman, uh, correctly points out that uh, Bart Ehrman is an apostate. And uh, this is not an ad hominem argument. An apostate is a person who was once a believer in Jesus Christ and has fallen away. And, uh, you know, there are examples of that. Uh, Simon the Sorcerer once, you know, claimed to believe in Jesus and he fell away. And um, some of Paul's companions as well uh, were once uh, believers. And... Um, they fell away as well from the faith, and um, you know it's it's a it's a heartache to see something like that. But um, the thing is, uh, he is an apostate, and uh, by his own admission, he's an apostate. And uh, I don't think he would be too bothered by the uh, by this label, if you want to put it that way. But it's a it's a correctly applied label. And um, with this in mind, I would like. Uh, my brothers and sisters, uh, to understand uh, that we really shouldn't be giving Bart Ehrman the time of day. And it's based on a passage in Scripture, which I'm going to read right now, and hopefully it's up there right now. Um, it's found in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. Now, um, Dr. Bart Ehrman does not have any faith in Jesus Christ. He is a natural man. He's an agnostic and an atheist, and he's an apostate. He once had knowledge, but for some reason or another, um, he no longer believes it or, or understands it. And uh, therefore, he may have a very big knowledge about verses in scripture. He can quote verses even better than some Christians that I know. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, but he doesn't understand them. Um, for a person to have saving understanding of the Bible, um, you need faith in Jesus Christ. And he doesn't have it. And uh, so he's a natural man, and he does not understand the things of the Spirit of God. Because they're foolishness to him. To him, they're, he doesn't know, and you know he doesn't believe it. So, um, again, the Christian shouldn't be giving this man the time of day. Um, the reason why we need to interact with him is that he's very popular. Uh, as you can see, he's an affable man. Uh, he makes, cracks some funny jokes and things like that. And, um, you know, people tend to listen to him. And uh, he's had several books out that are New York Times bestsellers. Uh, Misquoting Jesus, uh, Jesus Interrupted. Um, the heresy of orthodoxy, and quite a few others, and uh, so he's well, uh, he's well liked among, I guess, unbelievers, and uh, and therefore um, his challenges, even though what he says has been refuted over and over and over again throughout all of church history, um, he's bringing up same old arguments, um, as Solomon says, there's nothing new under the sun, and uh, maybe putting them in a different coat but uh, still the same old arguments. So Christians should not be giving this man the time of day. And uh, we really should not uh, consider him a Bible expert because he doesn't have a faith. He doesn't have the, the spiritual discernment to understand the scriptures properly. And uh, so what he does is he's importing a philosophy, a philosophy which is essentially a liberal philosophy, um, that there is no such thing as a supernatural, and he's applying it to the Bible. Um, that's a general statement on, on my part, and uh, you know he. Uh, uh, it's more depth, more there's more in depth there than just that. But uh, from uh, from just when you're looking at the forest, um, what you're seeing is an unbeliever, a person who does not believe in the supernatural, looking at the Bible from a non-supernaturalistic perspective. 
and he calls this uh, historic perspective. But um, historians throughout the whole, uh, throughout the centuries, have all said that Jesus Christ is a historical human being. Was a historical human. Well, he is because he's still living. But um, he was and is a uh, historical human being. And uh, they also say that he was he the miracles that were uh, associated with him uh, were true, happened, actually happened. So from a historical perspective, Jesus Christ um, is a historical person, and he is the Son of God. He is God Himself who became flesh. And uh, Dr. White, uh, Dr. White, Dr. Bart Ehrman tries to um, refute this by claiming to be historical. And all he's interested in is historical Jesus. And uh, this came up with Albert Schweitzer and many others. Um, we won't get into that. Um, just to point out that Dr. Bart Ehrman is not a very good historian when it comes to the historical aspects of things. So, that is Dr. Bart Ehrman. He is a distinguished professor of religion. He is an agnostic and an atheist. Um, he's an unbeliever and apostate. And uh, these are not labels that I am applying to him. These are things that he self-admits. He used to be a Christian. He used to be a fundamentalist. And now he is no longer. And, um, and that's, his, that's, his, that's his sadness. But anyway, um, we're going to look next at Dr. Bart Ehrman's uh, use of um, higher or source criticism. And so that's our next segment. So let's take a look at that next segment. So what is higher criticism? Higher criticism or source criticism is a type of textual criticism that first arose uh, among secular writings. Um, higher criticism is the view that um, an author may or may not be the author of his uh, text. Uh, what it does is it looks at style and uh, if, uh, differences in style indicate differences in authors. Um, when it comes to the Bible, uh, those of you who have been to seminary or Bible college and taken Bible classes are familiar with the documentary hypothesis. That is a hypothesis among source critics, uh, higher critics. And what they're trying to do is they're trying to find the source for the, for the text. And in doing so, they treat the text not as the divine word, as uh, the word of God, but as a word of the human be human beings. And they're just trying to figure out where did where did they get these ideas, where did these different authors get these ideas. Uh, the documentary hypothesis, very famous, it's well talked about in seminaries and and colleges and things like that, um, is the view that Moses did not write the first five books of the Bible. Um, that there were actually four authors and one editor um, called the JEPD theory um, based on the four different authors. J being the Yahwehist or the Jehovahist. Uh, e being the Elohim. Uh, 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 JEP is the priestly and D is the Deuteronomy. And what they're doing is they're looking at the different styles of these uh, different uh, the different books, and uh, they're saying essentially that uh, these are different styles, and therefore Moses couldn't have written it. Um, for instance, the Yahwehist or the Jehovahist, if you want, uh, you want to use the older term, um, <coughs> uses the word Jehovah exclusively in reference to God. And so, when you're looking through the Book of Genesis, for example, and you find the word Jehovah, that's the Jehovahist who's writing. That's the you know, that's his style, you know, and therefore, you know, it's Jehovah's. And then there's the Elohim, which is another word in Hebrew for God. Um, it's also, it's a plural form, so it's also used for other gods as well. But it's also used uh, for, the, for the one true God. And that's where a lot of, um, that's where we get the Trinity from. We get, y Yahweh is singular, it's one God, and Elohim is plural, and... Quite often these two words are put together, Yahweh, Elohim. There's one God, many persons. Anyway, the Elohist, or the, the Elohim writer, 
uh, uses the word Elohim exclusively. And so whenever you see in Genesis um, the word Elohim, you're going to find uh, that, that it's a different author. It's a different style. He's using a different word, and therefore it's a different author. And uh, then, of course, there's the priestly uh, 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 writer who wrote, uh, like, Numbers, um, Leviticus, Numbers, that kind of thing. And then there's the Deuteronomist. Um, Deuteronomy is, is essentially just a series of sermons uh, spoken, I believe, by, by Moses and written down by him. Um, but uh, there are those who say, well, because the style of Deuteronomy is different from the style in Genesis, it couldn't have been the same author. The style of Deuteronomy is different from the style of Exodus. It couldn't have been the, it couldn't have been the same author. The style of uh, Genesis is different from the style of Exodus, so it couldn't be a, a different. It has to be a different author. Um, this theory uh, using style has been so well refuted. Um, that only the most stubborn, uh, those who are the most um, adamant about denying the Bible as being the Word of God, uh, hold to it. And uh, ultra liberals, and that's what Dr. Uh, those are the people whom Dr. Uh, Ehrman is referring to here. There are among, if you want to put it this way, among the high scholars, uh, this idea that uh, the documentary hypothesis is still relevant it is easily refuted. Um, Moses lived 120 years, and uh, so his style is going to change over that time. The more he writes, but that's just not that's just one thing. Um, for instance, we'll take a look at Dr. Ehrman. Um, Dr. Ehrman went to college, and no doubt he took a history class. And in that history class in college, maybe his freshman, his junior, whenever ye whatever year, sophomore, junior year, uh, he had to write a paper on uh, some historical aspect of something or other. So uh, we have this paper that we know that Dr. Ehrman wrote when he was in college. And if we compare that style to his Ph.D. thesis, which was written, let's say, ten years later, um, and is about maybe about 200 pages, so I've never read it, but, I mean, he's, uh, you know, he, he wrote this Ph.D. thesis. The Ph.D. thesis is going to have technical terms in it, it's going to have words, it's going to have a completely different style than a paper he wrote in college as a sophomore, or freshman, or junior, or whatever. And uh, so, therefore, we have two different styles. It must be two different authors. So we, we, we assume that Dr. Um, Ehrman did not write his Ph.D. thesis because we know that he wrote this college paper in college. And there's two different, they're totally different styles, therefore they, they couldn't be, they couldn't be the uh, same author. That's a refutation. That's how um, this, this, this theory is, can be easily refuted. Um, a person's style changes. It changes over time because of age, because of experience, uh, because they become more um, familiar with the language, or because, in a sense, in a PhD thesis, because he has inundated himself in a huge study of the subject matter that he wrote on, um, he's going to have a remarkably different style and writing and vocabulary in his PhD thesis than he's going to have in a college paper, or even a paper when he written was he wrote as a as a master's st study. So um, this theory that uh, the documentary hypothesis and the idea of higher criticism has been thoroughly and utterly refuted. Um, Moses, for example, could very well have been the one who wrote the five books of the uh, of the Bible of the the Pentateuch. I mean, for instance, for in, in Genesis, he may have been drawing upon um, uh, oral tradition. He may have been drawing on several oral traditions, but it doesn't mean that he didn't write it. I mean, he was the first one to maybe write it all down, or maybe he was taking. So I think, for instance, when you're looking at the first few chapters of the book of Genesis, um, you're reading um, Adam's words. The words that Adam spoke to his son, and his son spoke to his son, and all the way down the line 
until you get to Moses. Now, you know, we, we, we can go into the idea of telephone and, that, and, and things like that, but um, again, what you're, you're treating the Bible as a human word and not as the word of God, God himself will oversee the transmission of his word throughout all ages in order to preserve his word from the very beginning. So I believe that when we are reading in the book of Genesis, the first, second, third chapters or so, we're reading the very words of Adam, that Adam spoke to his son, and the original uh, Adam who wrote these things, and eventually these things came down to Moses who wrote them down. I mean, what's the big problem with that? The book of Exodus is, is essentially an autobiography of, um, of Moses, and there's no reason why Moses wouldn't have written Exodus, and, uh, and again, it would be a different style from Genesis, because Genesis was prior to Moses, and Moses was writing down oral tradition. Um, Leviticus, uh, the priestly, is a, is, a, is a manual for priests, and so it's going to have a different style. You see, a person's style changes with genre as well. When a person is writing down something historical, He's going to write it in a different style than he's going to write if it's writing if they're writing fiction, or if they're writing philosophy, or if they're writing uh, a scientific paper, for example. Um, these different styles is going to happen when different genres are are allowed. So there's no reason why why Moses didn't write Leviticus either. I mean, he's writing a manual for priests and uh, numbers. Um, even though there's historical aspects to it, is essentially an accounting system. And Deuteronomy, like I said, is a series of sermons that that, uh, that Moses wrote, and then he, he spoke, and then he wrote them down. Or maybe he wrote the sermons down, and then he spoke them, which is usually how a person writes sermons. They usually write them down first, and then, and then speak them. So the documentary hypothesis has been completely and utterly refuted, and this whole idea of higher criticism is a canard. It's an attempt to say, okay, this person didn't write this particular passage or book in the Bible because it's a completely different style than you know what we see in other places. Um, this higher criticism, though some people may not be aware, is also applied to Isaiah. Uh, there are four different authors in Isaiah. There's Isaiah, the original Isaiah, and then there are three supposedly students of Isaiah who wrote, uh, who wrote the rest of it. And again, they're trying to do that because they want to make the prophecies in Isaiah seem like they're not prophecies, but simply uh, historical recountings. Like, for instance, I could say, um, before the 2012 election, I could prophesy and say that Obama is going to win. Or I can say it today and say Obama uh, is going to win the 2012 election. And uh, either way, uh, you know, that's what they're trying to do. They're trying to say that what I said before is really what I said after the incident. And therefore, um, Isaiah didn't write the first, uh, you know, all of the book of Isaiah. And, you know, uh, so whenever you see these uh, men uh, talking about style and then making the claim that the style is different from what the author writes, um, it doesn't work. It's not legitimate. Um, a major uh, argument against the last 12 verses of Mark is that Mark, it's not Mark's style. It's a completely different style. He uses different words. He uses different you know, language, etc. Um, again, that's based on style. It's not based on reality. And uh, overwhelmingly, uh, the manuscripts that contain Mark uh, contain, I mean, there's only two manuscripts that don't have it. So anyway, <clears throat> that's, uh, that's not the point. The point is, is that if you base your views of style on, uh, on whether or not an author wrote it, then we can say that Dr. Ehrman didn't write his Ph.D. thesis. Or we could say he didn't write his college uh, paper because he wrote his Ph.D. thesis. Um, either way, um, a person's style is going to change. It's going to change because of their age how long they've been interacting, how much they write. Uh, the genre that they're writing in is going to, it's going to make a change. And um, 
you know, you can apply this to Shakespeare. Um, Shakespeare's uh, style of language in Troilus and Cressida is completely different than that in Hamlet. And therefore, Shakespeare couldn't have written these two. <laughs> There's even a theory about that. Francis Bacon wrote Shakespeare, you know, whatever. But, um, you know, you look at, even within the style of Hamlet, I mean, there are times when Shakespeare is writing poetry, there's sometimes when he's writing blank verse, and there's sometimes when he's just writing plain, plain writing. I mean, his style is changing in the difference. Your style is also going to change concerning your mood. If you're happy and excited about something, your style is going to show that. If you're sad and depressed about something, your style is going to show it. So, um, again, your style is, is different in, in when it comes to different subject matter, genre, etc. So this whole idea of um, that there's a different style in, uh, and therefore it's a different author uh, just doesn't wash. And uh, what we're going to see is uh, Dr. Uh, Ehrman is going to cite high scholars, you know, these higher criti critical scholars, though he doesn't name them that, as um, claiming that Paul did not write uh, 2 Corinthians. Now, when it comes to 2 Corinthians, uh, he does go over the textual issues uh, in it and uh, points out that the first complete copy of 1 Corinthians we have is 140 A.D., about 140 years after or so that it was written, so 200 or so. But, um, <laughs> but just because we have a copy, a full copy of it, 140 years after it was written, doesn't mean that Paul wrote four different, five different, or two different um, letters. I mean, you know, where do you get that from? Um, his supposition is that Paul wrote these five letters, and later on somebody combined these five letters and came out with 1 Corinthians. There is no textual evidence to that matter. First, uh, 2 Corinthians has always been 2 Corinthians, um, all the way back to whenever, however far you can go. Uh, there is no evidence that Paul wrote these five from a manuscript perspective. He doesn't have any evidence. He, he supposes that this happened, but the supposing doesn't prove, is not proof. I mean, everybody has opinions, and, but that doesn't mean your opinions are right. You have to have your opinions based on facts, and those facts need to have uh, some, some uh, evidence for it, um, some some evidence in order to support it. So um, he's he's citing these things as facts, but they're not really facts. What it is is they're looking at the style of Second Corinthians, and they're saying there's two. One person is saying two. Another one is saying up to five different authors. Now in Second Corinthians, Paul is answering questions uh, on different subjects, and therefore. Uh, He's going to have different writings and different styles of writings depending upon the question that he's asked. If I'm asked, for instance, uh, that, uh, you know, where, where do you find the Trinity in the Bible? You know, I have to go, I will go and write an essay based on that. If I was asked a question about, you know, in a secular society where we have diverse groups, uh, how do you justify the idea of a universal uh, truth? It's going to be a completely different style. It's going to be citing completely different verses, etc., and things like that. So, um, so I, again, your style is going to be different. So here we have, uh, here I'll show you just a brief clip uh, of Dr. Ehrman uh, pointing out that uh, his, and showing that what he is basing his views on are, are um, higher criticism or source criticism. Now, because of this, you don't have to be a TR or specifically CT man or even a majority text man in order to refute this. This is refuted philosophically. It's not refuted because of one's adherence to textual criticism, uh, except when you're talking about higher criticism. But higher criticism doesn't really have much to do with the manuscripts, etc. So anyway, here, here is Dr. Ehrman's presentation. Here's a bigger problem with respect to Paul writing 2 Corinthians, which is that Paul did not write 2 Corinthians. Paul 
Paul did not write the letter of 2 Corinthians as it has come to us today. Scholars have long recognized for over a century that 2 Corinthians is made up of at least two different letters that have been spliced together. Chapters 10 through 13 do not come from the same letter as chapters 1 through 9. Not only that, there are, there's a large number of scholars in both the United States and in Europe who maintain that 2 Corinthians, in fact, is made up of five separate letters that Paul wrote. In other words, Paul wrote five letters, and they were put in circulation and were copied and changed. Five letters. These were circulated and changed until somebody created our Second Corinthians by taking parts of these five letters and cutting them and pasting them together. This is a standard view in scholarship. You will find this taught in every major research university in North America, what I'm telling you now. This is not some kind of crazy idea that a particularly liberal professor at Chapel Hill thinks, uh, although it is that. <laughs> but, but, it, but it's not just that. Uh, this is this is standard fare, and virtually everybody who's a critical scholar agrees with what I've just told you. But what does that mean then? Somebody created the letter some years, maybe a couple of decades after Paul wrote, so that Paul didn't create Second Corinthians. Paul created created up to five letters that had been in circulation and probably changed that were then combined into Second Corinthians with a lot of the stuff cut out and other stuff put together. Then this letter. This amalgam is put in circulation, and it's changed over time. So you see, <clears throat> this section that Dr. Uh, Ehrman is talking about uh, is heavily influenced by the higher critical views. Um, he doesn't really say it in the, in, the, in the section. He does quote, you know, men from Harvard, from Princeton, from Yale, from uh, uh, University of Chicago, elsewhere. Uh, that uh, these all these high-powered men hold to this view. Well, yeah, but that doesn't mean it's right. And uh, and again, the idea of higher criticism has been thoroughly refuted. And it's only those who are most stubborn who are contrary to this uh, re refutation and hold that this is legitimate. Um, just after this, he will talk about Dr. Gunther Zunz and uh, Gunther Zunz's uh, hypothesis that uh, Paul's letters, around 100 or so uh, A.D., were amalgamated. They came together. You know, all the copies of Paul, that we have in Paul, from Romans all the way through to Hebrews, were put together in one book, and they, they were distributed around. But still, even that doesn't prove that there were five different letters Paul wrote for 2 Corinthians that eventually became 2 Corinthians, and that they were, uh, you know, condensed and edited together. There's no proof of that except when it comes to higher criticism. Um, it's the same thing with <clears throat> the idea of that song in Philippians uh, that uh, Paul has supposedly had uh, copied down. I mean, there's no evidence that it was a song. <laughs> it's just Paul may have been waxing eloquent at that moment. But um, again, you know, the idea that uh, source, that you're looking for the sources for these things, where the human documents come from, uh, is, uh, is the essence of higher criticism, and it's treating the Bible not as the word of God, but as the word of man. And again, <clears throat> I think that's the biggest flaw in uh, Dr. Ehrman's uh, whole presentations, is that it's anti-supernatural. And because of that, uh, he doesn't really recognize the fact that God can preserve his word <clears throat> over the centuries so that we have the very words that were written by Moses, by Adam, by Paul, by Isaiah with us today. <clears throat> Doctor, for that is, is out of the conception of Dr. Ehrman's, but it is a proof of the existence of God. And it's something that he rejects. He's an atheist when it comes to the God of the Bible. And I've asked if there is a God. He says, I don't know. So anyway, um, it shows uh, just where this man is coming from. And it shows that this man really should not be teaching in a university on the subject of religion. 
Um, if he wants to teach on the matters concerning his history, maybe, but even his anti-supernaturalism when it comes to history doesn't wash either. So, um, essentially, uh, Dr. Ehrman is fulfilling the passage in Scripture um, that um, in, in the book of Proverbs where it says, uh, a fool in his heart says that there is no God. And uh, he's showing himself to be a fool, even though he uses the term, I don't know. I don't know, I don't know, you don't know, is how he's trying, his, his, uh, the essence of his arguments. <clears throat> because I don't know, you don't know. And that's not the case. I know that there is a God. He speaks to me through his word. And he has protected me and saved me throughout my whole life. I mean... If it wasn't for God, I probably would be dead by now. And probably in a gutter somewhere, you know, drunk or whatever. But uh, God is good, and I know that He exists, and I know that He's real, and He has changed my heart, and He has shown me the truth in His Word. And He can do the same thing with Dr. Ehrman. He can do the same thing with anyone who watches these videos or reads the Bible for their, for their own. So anyway... Uh, this is just one refutation. I want to put down now, I want to show you a really, really interesting video uh, done by Stephen Colbert. And uh, Stephen Colbert had an interaction with, had actually two interactions with Dr. Ehrman. And um, Stephen Colbert, I think he's a professing Christian, um, though he tends to be a bit of a skeptic. And this video has some irreverent aspects to it. I, w I would call it irreverent. But um, I think it's interesting. It shows how uh, it just he just exposes Dr. Ehrman uh, really well. Uh, and I'm just going to show a short portion of this. Um, I had some difficulty downloading this. In fact, it was almost impossible to get it downloaded. So I had to film it off of my my computer here. So I apologize for the poor quality. I'll put a link to the uh, video in the uh, in the comments section below. So if you want to watch the whole thing in a better definition, then uh, you know, you're welcome to do so. Um, it's something that I recommend. Uh, Colbert does a really good job of refuting Dr. Um, Dr. Um, Ehrman. And actually in the end, Colbert is so embarrassed that he kind of like just throws him a bone by saying, well, why don't we wait until, you know, we're both dead and we can stand to God. But, um, the refutation is really good, and uh, that's why I want to present it. So uh, here's that refutation. In that very short clip, you see at the end Dr. Uh, Ehrman's face. Uh, he has been thoroughly refuted, and uh, he knows it, and there's nothing he can say. And like I, er I earlier mentioned, he, uh, Stephen Colbert gives him a way out. Well, why don't we just wait until you know we die and God will figure it out for us. And, um, but, uh, the thing is, I mean, Dr. Ehrman's, uh, presentations are easily refutable. Uh, you don't need to be a huge textual scholar. You don't need to know all the manuscripts, et cetera, et cetera. You just have to apply plain common sense and the scriptures to what Dr. Ehrman is saying. And, uh, you know, it's, <laughs> he loses it all. He has no response to it. And uh, it's, it's a shame that he is stubborn in his uh, views on these matters and that he uh, adamantly holds uh, to, these, uh, to this position, which is completely and utterly uh, without foundation. It's without foundation in the manuscript evidence. It's without foundation in philosophically, when we look at it from a higher critical position, uh, it has been completely refuted. And uh, I would recommend the whole video that uh, Stephen Colbert has uh, because he just does a really good job, even though in a very irreverent sense, I mean, referring to Jesus like an elephant. I understand where he's coming from, but it seems a bit irreverent. And I think that's why people laugh. But, um, I mean, the point is well taken. I mean, each of the Gospels is, is looking at Jesus from a different perspective. And it's when you look at all uh, all of the Gospels together that uh, you see the, um, the truth 
of who Jesus really is. And I think that's what, how God, that's how God wanted it, and that's how it came about. I mean, Dr. Ehrman says that Matthew, Mark, and Luke don't mention that Jesus is God, but the very first verse in, in Mark calls Jesus the Son of God. And, you know, there's a little funny reference uh, earlier when uh, Colbert is referring to, the, to uh, Jesus as God and the Son of God. So, but uh, I'll let you take a look at it if you want. And uh, it's a good video. It's, uh, it's funny. And uh, it, he, he does a really good job in refuting Dr. Uh, Ehrman. And he didn't need to refer to critical text or to the manuscripts, or to the papyri, or to the Alexandrian manuscripts, or to the Byzantine. You didn't have to do that. All you do is just take a look. Take a look at what Ehrman is saying, put some plain common sense to it, and and look at it from the scriptures. And, you know, he has no answer to it. And that's the, that's the telling part at the very end. Dr. Ehrman is speechless. He has no response to that. Um, what he was presented with was the truth. Uh, even though uh, Stephen Colbert did it kind of irreverently. Um, each of the Gospels is talking about Jesus in a different fashion, and therefore you're going to find differences. But they all mesh together. I mean, if you take any look at a harmony of the Gospels, you'll find that uh, all of the Gospels fit together. There's no contradictions there. Um, and, you know, Dr. Uh, um, Jesus was, for example, he was six hours on the cross. And uh, he didn't just say one or two things. He probably said a lot of things. He was probably talking with his mother, with his disciples who were there. Uh, he certainly talked with the, uh, with the uh, two thieves on the, uh, on the other crosses that were, that were on each side of him. And uh, so uh, for them to say that, well, you know, he only said this one thing, at the end of his, uh, uh, no, no, that's not true. Uh, he could have said all of the same, all of the things in in uh, chronological order. Uh, um, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Could have come before. Into your hands I commend my spirit. And when he finally died, and gave up his last breath. So, um, uh, again, this whole thing of Doctor Ehrman's. Uh, is is refutable even from a TR perspective, and it's a good apologetic. So let's go into Dr. Um, Dr. Ehrman's actual uh, use of textual criticism in this last part of this uh, of this video. So uh, here we go. So now we come to it. We come to Dr. Bart Ehrman's views concerning textual criticism and uh, the Texas Receptus, uh, those who hold the Texas Receptus, the Westminster Divines, the Reformed views, for instance, for example. Uh, in his book, uh, uh, Jesus Interrupted, um, he talks about uh, many uh, passages uh, that he claims are problematic. Uh, most of these are ones that I've dealt with already. Um, the Pericope Adulterae, for instance, um, the Comma Johannium. There are other, other uh, videos that I have done, and therefore I'm not going to go over those uh, that material again. Um, for Dr. Bart Ehrman, these passages are significant because they affect Christian doctrine. And the standard answer is that even though we may uh, omit these, the, the standard Christian doctrine is not affected really. You can find, for instance, the Trinity in other places in Scripture. And you can find the forgiveness of sins in other places of, in Scripture as well. Um, so for Dr. Ehrman, um, these are significant, but for most scholars, and most Reformed scholars, it's not significant. Um, it should be significant for Reformed scholars, because we believe that every word of the living God is written. And we have not lost it at all. And um, 
for the TR, it's important the, for those who are involved with the Texas Receptus. Passages like the Pericope Adulterae, or the last twelve, um, the last twelve verses of Mark, and um, and uh, the Commiohanium are important because we believe that these are scriptures and that to edit them out is unwarranted. And again, I have gone over those passages in scripture and shown that they should not they should not be edited out. So um, what Dr. Bart Ehrman does. Uh, in his debate with uh, uh, Dr. White, he enumerates uh, nine points that, uh, that encapsulate his uh, views of textual criticism and how he uses it. So instead of showing you the video, um, it's in the video of Dr. White uh, versus Dr. Ehrman, and it's around uh, one, uh, one hour and 12 minutes in or so. And... Uh, and so I will just commend that to you. What I'm going to do is I'm going to post these nine points, and then uh, we'll take a look at them uh, systematically. Uh, some of them we'll look at faster than others. And uh, after I post these nine points, I'm going to quote from B.B. Uh, Warfield, and uh, a quote that I have used before in other passage in other uh, videos. And uh, but I think it's important, and it it does address most of Dr. Uh, Ehrman's, Ehrman's concerns on this matter. So here are the, here are the nine points and uh, let's go over them. Um, the first point that Dr. Ehrman, Ehrman makes is that we don't have the originals and that's an obvious truth. The actual original manuscripts uh, we don't have. We don't have the actual autographs that Paul wrote, or Peter wrote, or whoever wrote. Um, Dr. Ehrman also likes to point out that, you know, how can we even talk about the autographs when it comes to Peter, who was unlettered and unlearned. Um, Peter could have dictated his letters. Pretty simple, just like Paul dictated his letters. So, um, uh, that's just an aside. Uh, we don't have the originals. That's true. Everybody admits that. Um, so, uh, I don't know, uh, it's a part that he wants to make of his points. So number two, the copies that we have were made centuries later. Yeah, copies that we have were made centuries later, but the copies that they had a century ago, you know, I mean, when we go back, we go back to the very first century, second century of the Christian, uh, Christian era. And uh, so the copies that we made were made centuries later, and that's true. Some of them were. Some of them were made only decades later. That we some, some of them were. I mean, if you're looking at the Magdalen Papyrus, I mean that's that's made at the same time as the uh, almost the same time. I think it's I think uh, feed uh, dates it to about 60 A.D. or 70 A.D. or so, or around 70 A.D. or so. So, um, you know, we have manuscripts that go back first century, or at least that, that one is, and that's disputed. So, but second century, most definitely, which is about a hundred years or so after the originals were made. Um, we have thousands of copies, is his third uh, point. And, uh, yeah, we have thousands of copies, and that's a good thing. Uh, Dr. White likes to point out, and I think he points out correctly, that uh, we have, for instance, in a puzzle that's uh, 10,000 pieces, uh, has 10,000 pieces, we have 10,100 uh, pieces. We have more than we need, um, which means we also have all 10,000 pieces. Um, the whole of the scriptures are there. And, uh, and though there have been some added, some, some subtractions, in different manuscripts, uh, we have every single word uh, preserved for us today. Um, these copies contain mistakes. That's his fourth point. And here's where we get into his anti-supernaturalism. Um, sure, the copies will make will have mistakes in them, but not every single copy has every single mistake. There were scribes in Galatia. There were scribes in Thessalonica. 
there were scribes in Rome, there were scribes in Jerusalem, and all these men are copying manuscripts. They're not making the same mistakes. They're making, they may be making different mistakes, but what one, and this is what uh, B.B. Warfield is going to point out, what well, one mistake you find in one copy is corrected in the others. So that when we compare all of these thousands of manuscripts together, we can see and it becomes evident that the, that of what the mistakes are and what are not the mistakes. So again, uh, he's, uh, Dr. Ehrman is arguing against himself when he talks about the mistakes because he's only talking about it from an anti-supernatural perspective. If, okay, these passages, these books were written by simply human beings and they were not preserved by God, then those mistakes, then we would be distraught as to, you know, what is the original writings there. But even when we look at uh, writings of secular people like Plato or Aristotle, uh, we don't have as many copies we have significantly fewer ones and most of these copies are made even a thousand years the closest ones that we have to Plato or Aristotle I think are 800 to a thousand years after they wrote and yet we're confident that we're reading the words of Plato and Aristotle so I, I, the thing is the copying process during the ancient times is a, was a lot different than it is today we don't have to rely on being absolutely accurate in our copying because we have copy machines. We have uh, all kinds of things. We have the internet. We have um, we have computers, and we have all we have scanners, and we have and, you know all of these different things. So we don't have to be as accurate when we do copying. But back then, it was an art. It was a form. It was it was something that uh, scribes took seriously. And they did a seriously good job, and when they when they copied manuscripts, you know, so you know we do have many co uh, mistakes. Uh, I believe the average of what scholars say is about five hundred thousand. There's only one hundred forty thousand words in the, uh, according to Dr. Um, Wallace, one hundred forty thousand words in the New Testament, and therefore we have more errors than we have. Uh, words in the New Testament, and that's true, but uh, those errors uh, can be easily spotted and weeded out. Uh, number five, he says, we don't know how many mistakes there are among surviving copies. Uh, I don't understand where he gets that from. Uh, why don't we know? I mean, if God is speaking through his word, and he's saying, these are the words that I wrote, then how do we not know? And again, here we have um, Dr. Ehrman talking about his uh, agnosticism. I don't know. I don't know. You don't know. We don't know. And uh, it's not true. We do know. A Christian can be completely and utterly confident that what he is reading in the Greek and the Hebrew in the Texas Receptus, that... Uh, that the Bible is, that, that, that he's reading the actual words of the living God. The thing is, when it comes to like the critical text, you don't know, because that's their philosophy. Their philosophy is built on a human understanding of things, on the sand, if you want to put it that way, of human opinion. And Jesus talks about the sand and the rock. And uh, human, human philosophy, human opinion is only going to bring about human philosophy and human opinion. Um, when God has preserved his word through all ages, he preserved it during the Reformation. And the Reformation had the manuscripts necessary for them to print a Greek text that is the very word of living God, and that is Stephen's 1550. And no one has been able to refute it uh, since then. I mean, Beza and other people have added to it and changed it a bit, but uh, Stephen's 1550 still remains in print. So anyway, we're going to talk about Stephen's 1550 in the next video. The vast majority of the mistakes are completely insignificant. That's true. We'll say if there are 500,000, 499,900 of them insignificant. 
So uh, some mistakes matter a lot, and we've, we've talked about that. Um, the pericope adulterae, the uh, comiohanium, the last 12 verses. Uh, we've all, I've all mentioned those before in other videos. Um, the text, the task of textual criticism is to figure out what the author really wrote. Um, that is where I disagree with uh, Bart Ehrman. I don't believe that textual criticism determines the Word of God. I believe that the Word of God determines textual criticism, if you want to put it that way. It is God himself speaking through his Word that tells the Christian that what he is reading is the Word of God. And not only the Christian, but this is God it testifies this in the heart of the unbeliever as well. So that the unbeliever is without excuse. Um, what God says, God testifies to. And God will testify it through all ages, through all the manuscripts. Not that any one particular one is completely error-free, but that all of them, when you look at them combined, will show you the Word of God. So anyway, um, so that number eight is one that I disagree with. And I, I think I uh, address that matter. And, you know, we're going to look at it even more with... Um, with B.B. Warfield's quote. And then number nine, there are some places where we will never know the original text. The surviving extant manuscripts do not agree. Um, again, this is a matter concerning unbelief. Uh, sure, Dr. Uh, Dr. Uh, Ehrman might uh, think that he's, uh, he will never know what the true word of the living God is, in some places, but that doesn't preclude the fact that God will teach the Christian the truth and show him the truth. And then, at the end of all this, Dr. Ehrman has uh, something to say concerning uh, providential preservation, and uh, this is this kind of sums up his whole views concerning textual criticism. He says. If God did inspire the words of the Bible to make sure that the human authors wrote what he wanted to be written, why did he not preserve the words of the Bible, making sure the human scribes who copied the text wrote what he wanted to be written? And uh, here, Dr. Ehrman is taking his views of anti-supernaturalism and applying them in a way that is not true. Um, just because God preserved his word in a way that is not uh, consistent with what Dr. Ehrman wants doesn't mean that God didn't preserve his word. Uh, God may have had used a different method of preserving his word than the one that Dr. Ehrman insists on. What Dr. Ehrman really is looking for is he's looking for one particular manuscript that is perfect. And, you know, that's not what we have and that's not what God gave us. God gave us a multitude of manuscripts written over a vast uh, a changing in times in places. Some of these manuscripts were written in Alexandria. Some of them were written in Caesarea. Some of them were written in Rome and in, in, uh, in Byzantine and all the, uh, all the other places, all throughout the Roman Empire in different locations, and yet they all agree. So, how, isn't that more of a miracle than if God just preserved one manuscript perfect? That God can, can have scribes who make mistakes in Alexandria and Caesarea and Byzantine and Rome, etc., and, uh, and they all agree. And even though there may be differences among them, those differences are easily spotted and shown. So uh, God did preserve his, his manuscript, his, his words. And those words were handed down to us through the centuries to the Reformation, where Erasmus uh, collated the first uh, Greek manuscript. Well, he didn't really co he collated a diglot, which was a Latin and a Greek manuscript. And though even that had mistakes in it, it was later perfected in uh, 1550 by Stevens. So we have the very living the word of the living God found in Stevens 1550. And uh, 
you know, even though extant manuscripts today may disagree with some of the passages that you find in Stevens, that's not the case that of what happened in, during the Reformation with Stevens, who had manuscripts that contained the comma, that had the pericope adultery in the correct place, that had the last 12 verses, um, etc., etc. So um, we can be confident that uh, we have the word of the living God in Stephen's 1550. And uh, with this, with that uh, point, now we can take a look at what B.B. Uh, uh, Warfield says. I'm reading B.B. Uh, Warfield in uh, volume 6 of his, uh, of his works on uh, page 238. Um, you should have it already up there. B.B. Warfield writes, when it is affirmed that the transmission has been kept pure, there is, of course, no intention to assert that no errors have crept into the original text during its transmission through so many ages by hand copying in the printing press. Nor is there any intention to assert that the precise text, quote, immediately inspired by God, end quote, lies complete and entire without the slightest corruptions on the pages of any one extant copy. The, differences, the difference between the infallibility or errorlessness of immediate inspiration and the fallibility or liability to error of men operating under God's providential care alone is intended to be taken at, the full va at its full value. But it is intended to assert most strongly first that the autographs of scripture as immediately inspired were in the highest sense the very word of God, and trustworthy in every detail. And next, that God's singular care, God's singular providential care, has preserved to the church through every vicissitude, sorry, I'm, I have a cold, these inspired and infallible scriptures, diffused indeed in the multitude of copies, but safe and accessible. Quote, what mistake is in one copy is corrected in another, end quote, was the proverbial philosophy of the time in this matter. And the assertion that the inspired text has, by God's singular care and providence, been kept pure in all ages, quote, end quote, is to be understood not as if it affirmed that every copy has been kept pure from all error, but that the genuine text has been kept safe in the multitude of copies, so as never to be out of the reach of the Church of God in the use of ordinary means. And that uh, is B.B. Uh, Warfield. Um, what he says in the next couple of sentences I don't agree with. But in a sense, in essence, B.B. Warfield is expressing what the Reformers believed. That, um, that the Bible was, has been preserved, not in one manuscript, but in all of them in all of the uh, texts that we have. I mean, you could even include the early church fathers' citations as well as um, uh, various uh, translations that have been done. If you're going to look at one particular text that has been preserved through all the ages, then you have to look at the Greek Orthodox, the what they call the pat patriarchal text. Um, this text was is the Greek text found by the Greek churches. The Greek Orthodox Church had the autographs. Well, the early church had the autographs, but what became the Greek Orthodox Church, those churches turned into the Greek Orthodox Church, and they carried with them the manuscripts uh, that were copied and copied and copied and copied. And these manuscripts, separate from, from Erasmus's uh, text, are in a complete agreement, including the pericope, including the, the comma, including the last 12 verses, including all the problematic verses that you're talking about. So the Greek Orthodox Church, if I can put it that way, from the second century on, preserved the Greek text through all the ages. And, uh, you know, now, you know, they have, they have uh, study, study Bibles and things like that, and modern uh, textual criticism has had an influence on them 
and uh, they have been, you know, waffling a bit concerning, for instance, the comma and uh, other places. But uh, even still, the testimony of the Greek Orthodox Church throughout all ages is the Textus Receptus. The patriarchal text and the TR are virtually identical uh, to such an extent that, you know, you really can't, you really can't say they're different. So, so that's it. We have, all right, refuted Dr. Ehrman's uh, views on textual criticism, and we have done so using the Textus Receptus, because God has preserved his word throughout all the ages. And uh, even in the Alexandrian manuscripts, we have that preservation. P66, for example, is a very good example of a scribe who is taking a TR type text and he's rewriting it into a, a quote Alexandrian form. Uh, I'd, I'd love to ask Dr. White what an Alexandrian form is. I mean, I'd like to, for him to tell me how do you identify an Alexandrian form, uh, which I have never heard him give us a really clear example of that. But anyway, um, in this short presentation, um, the idea of uh, Bart Ehrman's uh, views on textual criticism, his nine points here, and uh, his views concerning preservation are completely answered. Uh, the reformers had answers to all of these questions, and uh, those answers haven't changed over time or because of new extant manuscripts. Um, actually, what we have right now in the printed text of the Stevens 1550 uh, we don't need the manuscripts anymore because we have the printed text. And the printed texts have supplanted the, the manuscripts, the papyrus, as Dr. White likes to say. We no longer need them. They're good to have for apologetic uh, reasons, but uh, they're not necessary anymore since we have the original autographs found in Stephen's 1550 in the Texas Receptus. So there it is brothers and sisters. I, uh, if you have any questions or if you, if I have missed some points that um, you'd like me to address concerning Bart Ehrman, then uh, feel free to text me. Uh, either write a comment here or email me or however you'd like to uh, converse. And I will be more than happy to uh, address those, those points that you would like me to make. So thank you again for watching this video. May God bless you and keep you all the days of your life. And this video is for Christ's crown and covenant. Amen.